Tonight we wish to focus our attention once again, going to the letter to the Hebrews. Tonight we're in the 10th chapter, and we begin reading at verse 19. Brothers, we have confidence to enter the most holy place through the blood of Jesus. It is a new and living way he opened for us through the curtain that is his flesh. We also have a great priest over the house of God. So let us approach with all, with all, with all a sincere heart in full, full confidence of faith because our hearts have been sprinkled to take away a bad conscience and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold on firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. Let us also consider carefully how to spur each other on to love and good works. Let us not neglect meeting together as some have the habit of doing. Rather, let us encourage each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. Bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue in our Lenten journey this evening, lead us to see the special privilege you've given us of all being priests in your sight. And as priests, we have the privilege to enter into your presence. Let this boldness be reflected in our lives daily as we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. As you know by now, as I mentioned at the beginning of our Lenten season, Our text would be taken out of this letter to the Hebrews because the letter to the Hebrews is the only specific place actually in the New Testament that deals with Jesus' high priesthood. Now we've considered various aspects of the worship that God gave to the children of Israel in the Old Testament. We took a look at, in the course of our study, the high priest with his official priestly garments. We've looked at the animals that the priest would bring to the temple and offer day after day, all of these sacrifices being offered according to the way in which God prescribed it. We've taken a look at the altar that stood outside the tabernacle proper or temple proper. Tonight, we want to take a look at the tabernacle itself. We haven't looked into it yet. We haven't entered into it. And if we think in terms of Old Testament people, we might say, well, there's a reason we haven't entered into it. We can't enter into it. Only the priests were permitted to enter into it. Only the priests could go into the holy place, the first room, and only the high priest could enter into the holy of holies, which was divided off from the holy place by a large curtain, and he only did that one day out of the year on the Day of Atonement. So when the first readers of this letter would have read these words that are before us this evening, it really, in a sense, would have been a shock to their hearing because for them it was impossible to pass through this curtain to go into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God. In their minds, only the priests could do this. How could they, how could we, as common sinners, possibly think of doing that? Well, that's the question that the writer to the Hebrews answers for us this evening in our text. As we continue to take a look at Jesus, that great high priest, that theme which Pastor Bartz focused on last week, we want to now add to that concept that he makes us priests as our great high priest. Tonight we're going to see that as priests we have the right to enter into the presence of God through Christ's body, and then we're going to see we have the right to enter into God's presence through Christ boldly. The Old Testament tabernacle, you know, today when congregations build churches, they might enlist the help of an architect, they sit down, they come up with various ideas and plans and try to design a church that's going to be functional and meets their needs. Well, the Old Testament people didn't have to do this. God had a floor plan. In fact, the writer to the Hebrews tells us it was patterned after the heavenly one. And here you have a diagram. It's not the largest, but the outer part, if you understand it, is actually the courtyard. That's not the tabernacle itself. 
What we're really focused on is that rectangular shape inside of it. And there, once again, you have two rooms. These rooms consist of a space 45 feet long and 15 feet wide. The first room that you would enter into, the one farthest, the area farthest to the right, you'll see there is that uh, red squiggly line. You're entering into, first of all, the holy place. And in that holy place, as you can see on the chart, is the table of showbread. You have the golden lampstand. There is also a small altar there that was used for burning incense. Now, it was separated from the smaller room, the smaller room, which is a cube, by the way, 15 by 15 by 15 high, and that room was known as the most holy place, or sometimes referred to as the Holy of Holies. Now, what is in the Holy of Holies? You've got the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, which contains the two tablets of stone. It's got um, Moses' stick. It's got uh, the showbread, or the manna that was uh, eaten in the wilderness in there. And then above it, you have what's known as the mercy seat or the atonement cover. What did the Ark of the Covenant serve as? It served as God's throne because this was his room in the tabernacle. In fact, there was a cloud that, it, that was in that room which represented his presence. It was a place that was shrouded in mystery. You know why I say that? Because as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, nobody really knew what it looked like in there because nobody could go into it. It was off limits. The only person that could go behind that curtain, as I mentioned a moment ago, is the high priest. And he only did that one day out of the year, and he couldn't enter into that room without blood. He would enter into that room, first of all, with the blood of a bull, and that was for himself and for his own family. Then he would enter back, he'd go back out, slaughter a lamb, and he'd bring that blood in for the sake of the people. Anyone who dared go into that room, what did it mean? Death. They would die immediately. The Jews knew all about the most holy place, and they knew how it was off limits to them. So it would certainly have caught their attention when they would hear the writer to the Hebrews say, we have confidence to enter the most holy place. See, to them it was unthinkable to go into that room. It was unthinkable to go into the presence of God. And yet, he's saying, we have confidence to enter the most holy place. The statement becomes even more startling when we consider the fact that this is where God dwelt in the temple or in the tabernacle. It was unheard of for anyone to go in there. The words of David would echo in the ears of these people who wrote, the arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. Who can come before God, whose glory Isaiah saw and filled with fear cried out, woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. How could anyone who was sinful go into this room, into the presence of a holy God? Well, in the temple or in the tabernacle, there was only one way. You had to go through the curtain, a heavy curtain. It, held, it hid God's presence from the people and reminded them that they, every day, were doing what? Falling short of the glory of God. Every day they were breaking God's commandments. Every day the door to heaven was locked to them. And what was true for Israel is true for us as well. Sin has created this great barrier that doesn't permit us to enter into the presence of God and live. The prophet Isaiah described it that way in the 59th chapter when he said, But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So what has sin done? It's, it's created this great gulf between us and God. And there is no amount of effort on our part that can begin to even build a bridge that can go across it. And yet, there was hope. That hope was proclaimed every year when the high priest led the children of Israel in that day of atonement. Every year when that high priest went behind that curtain, God was speaking of hope. 
Every year when he sprinkled the blood of the Lamb on the Ark of the Covenant to take away the sins of the people, he was speaking hope. Not hope because the people were bringing the blood of the Lamb. Because every year when the high priest came out of the Holy of Holies, if he were to turn around and look, what's there? The curtain is still there. There's still a barrier. They still can't enter into the presence of God. It was a reminder to them that there was nothing in their hands that they could bring to God that was going to take away their guilt and sin. But what it also proclaimed was this, that God had a plan in place. And what did that plan consist of? That plan consisted of God so loving the world, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, a man we heard in our reading for this evening, he so loved the world that he did what? He gave his one and only son. His son was going to leave his throne on high, and we're going to talk more about that, by the way, this coming Sunday, as we talk about that descent of Jesus coming down from heaven to live among us. He was willing to come here and to bleed and to die on an altar, the altar of the cross. Tonight we heard about that, didn't we? And tonight we also heard the verdict. You know what I'm talking about in our reading? When Jesus said it was finished, what happened? That curtain, which was 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, was as thick as the palm of of the hand of a man, which is said to have taken as many as 300 men to put in place, it was torn by the invisible hand of God. That the curtain is torn, that the curtain is brought down, says to us what? That the sin that separated us from God has been removed and there are no restrictions. What did Paul say? God in this act was reconciling us to himself, no longer counting our sins against him. He counted them against Jesus. Did you hear it tonight? My God, my God, why are you forsaking me? I'll tell you why he's forsaking you, Jesus. You've got my sins. That's why you're separated from the Father. And because he was willing to do that, because he shed his holy, precious blood, that curtain was taken away. God, in tearing down that curtain, was saying to all of us that the words of John the Baptist are true. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God is shouting that to the world here at Calvary. And so now notice what the writer to the Hebrews says. Brothers, because of this, we have confidence to enter the most holy place through the blood of Jesus. It is a new and living way he opened for us through the curtain that is his flesh. Do you see what the writer to the Hebrews is saying? He's saying he tore down the one curtain, the lifeless curtain, the, ca the curtain that was made out of cloth. He's put another curtain up. But it's a different curtain. It's a living curtain. It's the body of Christ. It's the flesh of Christ. The body of Jesus Christ is our great high priest. That body that once hung on the cross, that was placed in a grave, as we heard of tonight in our reading, was raised again. Raised again, a glorified body, proving that Jesus was correct when he said what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't get to the Father except going through me. How do we get into the Holy of Holies? It's through him. He's the curtain. Unlike the old veil that blocked the way to God and sealed that entrance to God's presence, Jesus opens it up for us. And what does he do? He invites us to come into his presence. What does he say to us in Matthew's gospel? Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Don't stand there shaking. Don't stand there quivering. Don't stand there with your head down. Come to me boldly. And so he promises, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. All who approach the Father through faith in Jesus, trusting that their sins, all their sins, whether they be sins of thought, sins of words, or sins of actions, those sins that we could not get rid of, that we could not pay for in full, they've been taken care of. They're gone. And we have full and free access to God. What only the high priest could do in the Old Testament, we are privileged today, today to do as priests of God. We can now come into the presence of God through Christ. 
There is another reason to praise our great high priest here this evening. Because he's made us priests who now can enter into God's presence boldly. The writer to the Hebrews goes on to say, So let us approach with with a sincere heart in full confidence of faith, because our hearts have been sprinkled to take away a bad conscience, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. Think about what he writes here. He says, come. Come unwavering. Come unshakable. Come completely confident. Don't be timid. Don't be afraid. Stop doubting, as he would say to Thomas later on, but firmly believe. Draw near. Come forward. Be bold as you draw into the presence of God. For what purpose? For what purpose do we go into the presence of God? Well, the first thing is we walk boldly into the presence of God to confess our sins. That's a strange thought, isn't it? If you think about it. Who of us as children boldly went to our parents to confess something we've done wrong? I can remember spending many hours trying to hide from them, okay? Until it was, I put off the inevitable, right? And then that moment wasn't pleasant, usually. No, we can go into the presence of the Father boldly. Does that mean we're proud of what we've done? Absolutely not. We know that what we've done is what put Jesus on the cross, But we also know that in the same breath, hiding that sin, making excuses for that sin, lying about that sin, does us no good. He invites, you know, you get back to the words I already quoted from Jesus. He says, come to me. And we can boldly go into his presence, know that he's not going to strike us down, but that he's going to allow us to approach him through the blood of his son. We know that that means now we can come to God with our songs, and sacrifices of praise. And no matter how poorly we might be able to carry a tune, no matter how inferior our songs might be in expressing what God has done for us, we know that they reach his ears, and when they reach his ears, he is pleased with them through the sacrifice that Christ made for us. By drawing near to God, it also means that we can go to him boldly and confidently with our prayers and our petitions. We can go to him, as David said in the psalm, in our time of need and be confident that he will not only hear but answer those prayers that is in a way that is best for us. God will not treat us when we come into his presence as our sins deserve. He won't have us bound hand and foot and cast us into the pits of hell because we've been sprinkled in the blood of Christ. We've been washed in the waters of holy baptism. We approach him not with our merit, but with the merit of Jesus Christ. That's been applied to us. In our baptism, we died with him and we were raised again to a new way of life. In the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we receive his body and his blood for what? The forgiveness of our sins. That's not an empty promise. We have been clothed, as Paul says to the Corinthian congregation, in his righteousness, cleansed and made holy in God's sight. Let's draw near to God boldly. We saw an example of that tonight in our reading. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the one thief on the cross. Now, if you caught that at the beginning of the narrative, both men were mocking Jesus. But at some point in time in the course of that act of crucifixion, one of those men had a change of heart. One of those men saw Jesus in a different light. One of those men saw Jesus as the centurion did at the end of the crucifixion, that he was the son of God. Now think about what this man had done. He was a criminal, probably spent the majority of his life in crime. He's paying for his wickedness. He's paying for his wrong. And yet what does he do? He's got the nerve to say to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. We might say out of anybody there, he doesn't have a right to do that. None of us have the right to do that. This is what God wants us to do. The Spirit opened his eyes and led him to see the truth about Jesus. 
That Jesus was dying not only for his sins, but for the sins of the entire world. So boldly, he comes into the presence of God. He goes into, we could say, the most holy place, and he says to Jesus, remember me. What boldness and what confidence. What a wonderful example for us in what God wants us to do. Remember that we are priests. You know, as we think back, just celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, I, I don't know if we always catch this. This is one of the great truths that was restored to the Christian church in the course of the Reformation. We are all priests in the eyes of God. Peter said, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. John reminds us of this truth in the book of Revelation when he writes, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. I serve as your pastor, not as your priest. You don't need me to get to God. God's called me into a special service to preach and teach his truth to you, to shepherd you as God's people. But you don't go through me to get to God. We all go through Jesus. We all stand before him, our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as our great high priest, what did Jesus show? Jesus showed a deep love for others. He showed a deep love and sense of well-being for others as he's on the cross. And we as priests are to show the same type of love for, to each other. The writer to the Hebrews closes this text by writing, Let us also consider carefully how to spur each other on to love and good works. Let us not neglect meeting together as some have the habit of doing. Rather, let us encourage each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. The writer to the Hebrews is reminding us that as priests we have an obligation to each other. As we boldly go into the presence of God, we need to see to it that we continue to encourage one another in these comforting truths. Each of us needs to have enough love for one another that we urge each other not to be neglecting the gospel and word and sacrament because that is the only means by which the Holy Spirit strengthens us in these wonderful truths of Jesus' priesthood so that we do not falter but that we boldly go into his presence confident that every time he says to us, it is finished, we are confident of the, truth, of the fact that our justification has been completed on our behalf. In these truths, then, we have the ability to live bold lives every day, not to our glory, but to the glory of him who has made us a part of his kingdom forever. That's what our Savior has made us. He's made us a kingdom. He's made us priests. We have access to God's presence. How? Through a curtain, which is the body of Christ, a new and a living way, the writer to the Hebrew says. So let us approach God boldly. Let us approach him boldly with our prayers in every time of need, not just for ourselves, but to also intercede for the needs of others. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Tonight's service continues with the gathering of our thank offering.